Kenya. Over to you, Lulu. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mrs. Papo. Uh, good morning, Stains. I greet you all in the wonderful name of my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And uh, it is my privilege once again to come to you this morning uh, with the word that comes from God. And before we get into it, I would like us to just close our eyes and uh, just receive the Holy Spirit once more. Dear Jesus, thank you for the beautiful day. It is a privilege to get up and to fall into your everlasting arms. Here is your word that you have said is living and powerful, sharper than any double-edged sword. And as it is about to be spoken to us, we open our hearts to receive you, dear Jesus. I pray that you may create in me a clean heart so that the words of my mouth and the meditations of my soul may be pleasing unto you. In your mighty name, oh Jesus, I pray. Uh, we are on day three of this uh, series of messages uh, speaking around issues of abuse and violence. And uh, we started uh, on the first week by saying, you are that man, you are that man. And we're looking at our own personal role, attitude and stereotype towards this issue of abuse. And uh, last week, as Mom Pop has uh, said, we were uh, looking at the issue of families and how our families can be those safe spaces and how God wants to use our families for the redemption of other families. And today, I would like us to look at the church in service. I hope you're noticing the progression. First, it was an individual, then it was a container, the family, and now we are moving now to the bigger container, the church. And I am going to read from the book of Luke, chapter four, from verse 16. The book is Luke, chapter four, from verse 16. And he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Esaias. And when he had opened the book, he found the place. Notice that he did not find a place, but he found the place where it was written. The spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He had sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to them that are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all that mourn, to give unto them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they might be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. Amen. So Jesus is in the synagogue. It's very first time here to come and minister. And when he is requested to stand up and read, he opens the scroll and he finds the place. So notice there is intentionality. When he goes into the scroll, he is looking for the mission statement. He's looking for what is going to proclaim and announce what he is here to do. So there's intentionality in declaring the, mes the, 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 the mission. It's not a trial and error thing. He's not trying to hit and miss and finding out what is going to work. He declares, this is why I am here. There's focus, there is determination, very clear. The reason why I'm here is to seek and to save that what, that was lost. I'm here to preach good tidings that I save, that is salvation in me. I'm here to set up uh, or to bind those who are brokenhearted. I'm proclaiming liberty to the captives. In my, in my language, Tosa, there's a song where we say, salvation has come unto us. He says, I'm here to open prison doors and I'm here to take those who are mourning and to give them a garment of praise. And uh, so he's so very clear. And he's also clear when he calls his disciples. He says, Follow me and I will make you fishers of men. There's just no way you can doubt what he is calling you to do. It's very, very clear to each and every one of his followers. He says, I am calling you to discipleship. I'm calling you because I want you to be fishers of men. And before he goes, he's very clear when he establishes the church. He establishes an institution that is going to be his representative on earth. He's leaving ambassadors 
of the kingdom that is to come. And if you're going to listen to what Sister White says about the role of the church, she says in one of her books, the savior has given his precious life in order to establish a church capable of ministering to the suffering, the sorrowful and the tempted. And he says, a company of believers may be poor, uneducated and unknown. Yet in Christ, they may do a work in the home, in the community, and even in the region beyond, whose results shall be as far reaching as eternity. Speaking about the church again in the book, uh, Acts of Apostles, uh, page nine, the church is God's appointed agency for the salvation of men. It was organized for service and its mission is to carry the gospel to the world. And it says the church is the repository of the riches of the grace of Christ. And through the church will eventually be made manifest even to the principalities and powers in heavenly places the final and full display of the love of God. So God wants to love the world. God wants the world to know that he loves them. And how is he doing that? He says, I've put my grace into the church. I want, I want to take my church and use it as that vessel. I want to display my love. I want the church to be an agent in my hand that is going to be used for the salvation of the world. And he says in page 11 of the same book, Acts of Apostles, the church is God's fortress his city of refuge, which he holds in a revolted world, in this wicked, revolted, dirty world. He says, I have a fortress, I have a city of refuge, and it is called the church. However, to a certain degree, the church has appeared confused regarding this greatest commission. Though the commission is so clear, the church seemed to be a bit a few, a, a confused at times around what is exactly our mission, what is our purpose? Why are we here? At times we are like a cow that drinks its own milk. We are like a light that is lit, but it is hid under the table. Yes, we run beautiful programs, but they are all for us. We cook delicious food, but we eat the food. And we do this year after year after year after year. And, and, and there's no growth because it's all by us and for us. All we do is year after year, we may change the audience a bit, we may change the packaging a bit, but it is all for us. And you know, even in terms of ministering to our own members sometimes, we tend to be program oriented and not people oriented so that we sometimes miss ministering to the felt needs of the members and the communities. So many of our Adventist churches have been in locations and in townships and in cities. And you find that even the people in the street where the church has been in existence for more than 50 years, they truly don't know what we are all about. They just know this group of peculiar people, these funny people who gather together every Saturday. And then they meet, open up, stay the whole day or half day. And then after hours, they close. And then the church is closed for six days a week until they come. They don't really know exactly what are these people about you know most of the time our young people have even claimed that the church is irrelevant when it comes to their real needs in fact one day i was speaking to another church and uh, this young man stood up and he said you know what the church has not been any useful to me i mean i've not received any concrete help from my own church he says you know when i was the church i've been the church now for a year and he says in subsequent days after i had disclosed to my church that I've lost my job. He says, I received beautiful verses. They were encouraging songs, but he says, no one offered practical help. No one asked me, so what are you eating? What are you living on? What about rent? Are your lights paid? Do you have money for transport? What, how can we help you secure a job? He says, instead, I got this help from my hidden friends on the road. He says, my friends would say, hey, tap rule in the morning, let me tell you, because I'm here is an Iwale. Data proof, you know, can you go out? I'm going to buy you something to eat. He says, I got this. He says, I was so disappointed. I was so angry because I felt here I have been worshiping in this church. I have been returning tithes. I have been paying offerings. I have been participating. But when life happens to me, all I can get just verses and good, beautiful music saying, you are in our thoughts and you are in our prayers. We are famous as a church for closing our eyes and ears to the desperate cries of the destitute, the unjustly treated. And we'll be found in our churches 
come Sabbath morning singing, we march into Zion, beautiful, beautiful Zion. Doesn't matter that on the way, like the priest and the Levite, we were passing a wounded, broken man, whispering, help me, help me. In fact, we're more likely to, to respond to that man. What are you doing on that road at that time to start with? What was your business there? Why weren't you staying at home where you're supposed to be? Oh, we'll be like, oh, I'm so sorry, man. I could help you, but I have a program that I'm running. And, and you know, I'm going to see you later. You know, I have been a member of this church for the seven years now. And 28 of those years have actually been as a pastor's wife. But I will say to you, it is the first time that I have seen in the Adventist Church an organized group like the one I've seen here, the business support group, where people are called, come and share about your business, want to support you, where they organize professionals to come and speak to, to, to people, how to develop your, 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 your business. These are the ways you can market. This is a, what it is about the text. And I'm like, what, 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 what a real way of ministering to someone. Every morning messages, don't give up. These are the tips that you are sharing. And this is a ministry to those who are hustling, to those who are unemployed. And it is a real service to the people's felt needs. And I want to say here in South Africa, the silence of the Adventist church, when it comes to societal issues has been too loud. Someone has rightly said, we are so heavenly minded that we are no earthly good. If you think about apartheid, the Adventist church was silent throughout the apartheid that was for that was going on for years and years decades we had other people fighting our battles we had people from england and italy and, and dubai and iran fighting our battles the Adventist church was all prim and proper so nicely well packaged oh we are the Sabbath keepers oh we're waiting for the coming of the lord but right in our midst people were being terrorized and treated like dogs for years nothing when it comes to issues of moral degeneration, when it comes to issues of substance abuse, teenage pregnancies, the church sometimes, we seem like we're not here. We're not here, you know? I spent a sleepless night uh, last uh, yesterday after a discussion I had had with my daughters, you know? We had seen the latest statistics of teenage pregnancies and Gauteng, I'm gonna call just Gauteng, and Gauteng says this year we have recorded 23,226 teenage pregnancies. And 934 of those babies were delivered to 10 to 14 year olds. Do you know, do, do you know what a 10 year old looks like? Can you imagine if you're going to have 934 10 year old, 11, 12, 13 year old babies giving birth to kids? And in that number, 19,316 were to 15 to 19 year olds. Imagine a 15, 16, 17. These are ills in the, in, the, in the communities where we live. This is the status in my own country, South Africa. And listen to how many abortions were done in the year. 2,976 by 10 to 19 year olds. And these are choice abortions. These are the cases where a 10 year old goes to the clinic, I'm pregnant, they recommend abort and then they're all for it. And this is the situation we are living in. You know, I, I, I could hardly sleep last night thinking about, I mean, I, I don't even want to think about KZN because I know it will be much worse than that. How is it possible? And the government brethren is helpless. They don't know what to do. They have no strategy to address such and they can't, but the church has such material. The church has such programs, but we are rolling them out to ourselves year in and year out. You know, you, you need, we need, we need, we need a summit. Women, we need a summit. We need, we need something. We need something. We need to come together. What are we going to do? We should be signing a memorandum, a memorandum of understand, understanding with the Department of Health, with the education we've got. In our church, we've got the education director in the church. What does he or she do? In our conferences, in churches, we've, we've got Directors, what are they doing? What are the directors, the education directors, what are they doing? If in our schools, we have got thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of teenagers who are getting pregnant. Are we rolling out programs in those churches? Or are we going to call ourselves one day, once a year and say, let us promote Adventist education. What about the dangers that are out there? In South Africa, I want to say, we've got two pandemics. We've got the COVID-19 pandemic, 
but we also have got the gender-based violence pandemic and the church has not escaped unscathed, you know? In August, 2019, Mama Zota invited me to a YOM conference and I was one of the speakers there. And I remember on a Friday night, I preached a message entitled, when somebody steals your shrine, when somebody steals your shrine. And I made an altar call to young women, not young women who have been sexually assaulted, not young women who have been exposed to rape, but young women who have been exposed to all of these atrocities, but they have found the church to be useless, to be useless, literally nada, no help, it doesn't exist, you are on your own, do it, do whatever situation. And Mama Zota will testify, more than 35 young women publicly stood, stood up sobbing, crying, running to the podium, some of them holding themselves, rocking themselves, some did not even stand on that day. And they came up to the stage, to, to the stage and it was to declare, I am broken like Tarmar. When I was naked, no one has found the blanket to cover my nakedness, the church in service. And yet Christ says, Christ's method alone will give true success in reaching the people. The Savior mingled with men as one who desired their good, showed his sympathy to them, ministered to their needs, won their confidence, and then he bade them follow me. There is need, brethren, so says Sister White, to come close to the people by personal effort. It's not going to help us to sermonize anymore. The time for sermonizing is over now. We need personal ministry. We need to get close to them. We need the ignorant to be instructed, the inexperienced to be counseled. We need to, to comfort the bereaved. We are to weep with those who weep. We are to rejoice with those who re, to rejoice. We are to be this vessel that is for the salvation of men. And this is what Christ declares right at the beginning of his mission. He says, the spirit of the Lord God is upon me. When there was a need, he was found to meet that need. Go to the to Kana and there's a wedding, there's no wine. He meets the need and he provides wine. Thousands are sitting down and they are hungry. He says, give you them something to eat. I want to say as I end, downloading programs for, from GC and not adapting them to our context makes us appear as unwise people. We live in a community where there are people are unemployed. And if the church is gonna be excited about running a program on budgeting, without running one on skills acquisition, without running one, to, running one to tell people how to get employed, without running one where we are, we are getting together and we're making connections and we're setting these small groups where people are being pointed to the right skills, we are a useless vessel. And as I come to an end, I just want to say, people are hungry, people are broken, people are hurting, people are resentful, kids are bringing themselves up, people are hell bound. But so are we, because Christ says many on that day will say, yes, you preached, yes, you taught, yes, you cast out demons, yes, you prayed, but away from me, away from me, because you did not do justice. You are a worker of iniquity. And when you ask, how did you do that? He will say, when I was hungry, you did not bring me no food. When I was naked, you did not clothe me. When I was in prison, you did not visit me. When I was destitute and broken, you did not come and offer me help. I pray that God will help us. And that as God is looking for a church that is going to be relevant, we will be found to be relevant, ministering to the felt needs of the people. Yes, the spirit of the Lord God is upon me. Yes, there is an anointing upon me. And it is to preach the good tidings to the poor. And it is to heal those who are brokenhearted. It is to offer help to those who need help. It is for healing to those who are broken. It is comfort to those who are hurting. Oh dear Jesus, how we pray that you might have mercy upon us, that you may forgive our helplessness, forgive our stupidity, forgive our ignorance and help us dear God to be relevant. We have got this anointing, we have got these beautiful programs, but how useless they are when you roll them in our midst year in and year out when there are people out there who are hungry. What beautiful programs of family life, but year after year, we teach them to ourselves, communities that know nothing about these things. What beautiful programs we have for youth, but we are teaching them to ourselves. When there are so many youth who are scattered, who are broken, who are desperate, who are ignorant, because they know no better. Please, dear Jesus, teach us to mind the times 
and to know that you are called for such a time as this. This is my humble prayer. In your mighty name, O Jesus. Amen.